I, let me see. Hold on. I'm just, I'm so curious because I had that random tweet that I had yesterday go viral. Mm -hmm. um, I have 1,300 likes and 468 retweets. Oh my Which tweet? God. So funny. Um, I just randomly um, shared like, the CNET article on the no, NASA didn't find parallel universes. It was a really well, I found it a really well, I usually I don't share CNET, but it was a well-written article. I added like the Carl Sagan quote at the top of it mm -hmm. saying, you know, like great declarations required, you know, great um, uh, evidence. And for some reason, Twitter moments picked it up as part of the Twitter moment of the the whole parallel universes thing. So, oh wow, yeah, she's part of the moment. I'm part of a moment. I can't imagine what it would be like to be somebody who gets that much traction on everything you tweet. You just check it out because the amount of not just people who are retweeting, but who are quote tweeting and commenting and this, and I'm like, you know, I I did like two two tweets attached to it one about siren show and my short um and the other about make sure to you know follow awesome scientists on twitter that can like elaborate on the cool science that this is you know covering and you know listed sean uh katie mack and uh phil and i was like okay i'm done well, I mean, it just, I mean, it is a full-time job and anyone who's like, anyone who thinks, oh, well, people on YouTube or TikTok or Twitter, whatever it is, who like are at that level, like they're doing it all the time or they have a company that is Team. then yeah. responding to all of that. Yep. Because one person alone can't do it. I mean, especially if you're busy making content and stuff like that. Well, that's the thing. There's the actual creation of it, which takes time and energy. Then there's the execution of the creation. And then there's the maintenance. Yeah, that's yep. it's a life cycle. All right. I'm Tamara Krinsky. This is Siren Show. We all talk about something we have found fascinating over the last week or so. Um, who wants to go first? Ooh, Gia, go you first. should go first. I'll go first. Hi, everybody. I'm Gia. Nice to meet you again. Um, <laughs> today we are going to talk about the color yellow because I wanted to know why is yellow the color of caution? I just wanted to know the science behind this because you see it everywhere and I thought there has to be some sort of reason for it. So of course I go to Quora for my first Google search. And one of the fascinating things about it is the color yellow is eye-catching 1.24 times faster than other colors. And I was like, well, where does this number come from? This is the problem when you start researching something is that you see a number like that. And if you're like us, you're not satisfied with why that number is an answer here. So I started digging a little further and I had to learn a lot more about the eye in general and how it sees yellow. So this is a piece from Indiana Public Media. Um, it's a really quick little uh, podcast you can listen to, but it talks about the different wavelengths. We all know what a rainbow is, right? Roy G. Biv. So on the infrared side and on the ultraviolet side, those are rays that we can't see. They're much smaller, but we start getting longer and longer wavelengths uh, closer to the middle here. So the longest ones are um, in yellow and green, and that's why our eyes are most sensitive to those colors. Um, and the reason that that is, is that our eye is full of these things called... Wait, sorry, I'm confused. Wait, I just want to... So yellow and green have the long... Or red has the longest and yellow and green are in the middle. Sorry, I said it wrong. They are, uh, they are longer. They are 570 to 580 nanometers. Infrared are much longer. Ultraviolet are much shorter. So it's right smack dab in the middle. Pretty gotcha. much. Thank you. And because of those, there's a reason why those particular colors work so well in the human eye. And it has to do with this piece, which is from Live Science. And it was literally about seeing the color yellow, which I thought was really interesting. So we see color because the light that we see is reflected off of a surface and then is bounced back into our eyes. And inside of our eyes are these photosensors called cones and rods. There are three kinds of cones, a red cone, a green cone, and a blue cone. And together, all of those help us see the spectrum of visible light that we can see. So uh, what happens when you see yellow is that the red and green channels, this is another cool site called Visually. This is about um, color theory, and that's a design site, which is really cool. Oh, cool. Uh, so be... red and green, uh, when your eye sees yellow, both the red and the green cones are stimulated. 
um, I'm going to see if I can get this correct. The second process of seeing it turns this red and green into depth perception. You get luminosity here. You get the black-white channel. Um, and then once you get that black-white channel, that's the difference between the red and the green channels. What's produced there is the yellow channel. Then your brain adds in the blue channel, and you see the color in total. And the reason that this yellow is so uh, easy to see is because it's stimulating both the red and the green cones in your eyes, of which there are, oh, I'm trying to remember now, millions, in, uh, it's on this one, sorry, oh, six to seven million cones in our eyes. Um, so anyway, so you get this, and then you can see on this wonderful little chart here, the lowest line is uh, blue, uh, the second line is red, and the first one, the big one you see is yellow up here, and it's because it's the, the wavelengths are longer. Because they're longer, it appears brighter. You recognize the change in that uh, color more quickly. That's where they get the 1.4 times. It has to do with these numbers here, which that's why I was like, oh, what is that? Um, and what's amazing, though, is that it got me down this whole other rabbit hole of people who um, are what they call tetrachromics, which I thought sounded right. like this. Yeah, this whole sci-fi thing, right? Yeah. yeah, no, I was going to ask. I'm like, what about tetrachromics? Yeah. So you have to have an X chromosome in order to have it, but instead of having... Three... Wait, hold on. Stop. Explain it for folks who may not know, like me. <laughs> yes. So I will explain it. Tetrachromic means instead of having three different color cones in your eyes, you have four, which gives you an additional color depth perception. Um, I'm going to back up for one second and say why yellow is also so important is it's um, what they call colorblind proof because people who are colorblind see this uh, band of colors here. Yellow still happens because their blindness happens in the green frequency and in the red frequency. But when both the red and the green are stimulated in the eye, you see the yellow, which they can still see. So it's colorblind proof. So people who have this tetrachromacy um, their, their rainbow is extended. The one woman that they interviewed in here, she sees 10 distinct colors in a rainbow, whereas we only see uh, red, orange, yellow, seven. green, seven. seven, right? Yeah. So she sees three extra colors, and it's only women that they, you have to have an X chromosome in order to even have tetrachromacy. And often um, men are more colorblind than percentage-wise than women. Absolutely. I want to know what the other colors are, but well, here's, even if they describe them, I wouldn't be able to see them. Yeah. So this is the kind of comparison that they gave of seeing like, oh, this is a yellow flower and this is the way that a tetrachromic would see it with these <sighs> greens and purples on the edges of it. Wow. But like, I'm still like, of course, this also takes my brain into sci-fi stuff too. Like that whole question of like, does the yellow that, is the yellow that you see the same yellow that I see? And so if they see, you know, several ex, extra colors, is that like on the flower you just showed us that they're seeing more detail of the colors we all know? Or is there like another color out there that Crayola has not figured out how to give a name to yet that we just, we don't know what it is. It's complete. There, um, Oliver Sacks did a bunch of research on um, people afflicted with synesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things uh, would be called Martian colors, where whatever the, the sensorial trigger was that activated them seeing color, it was a color that didn't exist. Um, and they couldn't quite describe what that color was. And it was called Martian colors. Oh. So it was something I just remember reading in one of his books. I want to see Martian colors. Like. Right? I want well, to see Oliver Sacks. I love Oliver Sacks. I want to see that documentary. I haven't seen that yet. Oh, the I have one that, um, uh, what's his name? Not Steve Allen. Um, the ex co founder of Microsoft who passed away. Paul his, Allen? Paul Allen, thank you. Yeah. His, um, his company, they, uh, his production company, they did, they, it's not released on a platform yet, but they've been screening it at festivals, mm -hmm. a documentary on Oliver Sacks. That's I would like to see that. Well, speaking of seeing things, there is a sort of tenuous connection between Gia's piece and my piece this week. Um, and I'll go and share my screen because mine is also about uh, how, we, how we see certain things like 
coronaviruses. My piece is actually about um, a scientist uh, named June Almeida. This is in the New York, I first came to the, her attention, she first came to my attention, um, through the Overlooked Project uh, with the New York Times, which aims to uh, put forth obituaries for folks who should have had them, had them written, but perhaps never did, um, so that their achievements can be recognized. And June Almeida was the scientist who actually, as part of a team, identified the first coronavirus. So I'm not exactly sure when this, when this particular episode will air, but, and hopefully we'll know a lot more about uh, COVID-19 and, and the virus that causes it by the time this airs, but regardless, knowing the history of it is really important. Um, so June was Scottish. Um, I would be tempted to try a Scottish accent, but that's just not a good idea. <laughs> um, so, and so one of the really interesting things is, um, that she, when she did this, she actually had no formal education. Um, so she, uh, was very smart, wanted to go to college, but it was post-World War II. Her family had very little money. Her father was a bus driver. So instead, she took an entry-level job in the histology department of a Glasgow hospital. And histology is the study of the, the microscopic study of tissues. So that's where she kind of learned these on-the-job skills that helped her down the road. And then ultimately, she went to Canada. She worked in labs there. She worked at facilities there. And then eventually, she came back to the UK and use the electron microscope to capture an image of what became known as the first coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, and so a couple things. Um, here is one of the images that she took. And so if you look here, you can see, you know, that we've all seen a lot of illustrations. I'm not sure how many folks have actually looked at, um, you know, sort of actual microscopic images, but you can kind of see here, hopefully on the screen, where there's that, that spiky corona that we talk about. And they came up with that name, she and her supervisor and the other Dr. Terrell that she was working with came up with that name together when they saw it. Um, the other interesting thing is that she had been, when she first noticed it, she had been, I'm trying to toggle between screens here. She had actually um, come in contact with something at a different point that was similar that was, I want to say it was uh, in chickens. And people actually were, they weren't ready to take it. She tried to publish papers on it and they weren't ready to name it as a separate virus. They just thought that her images were too muddy and she wasn't seeing clearly enough through the imaging that she was doing. So the development of this, you know, I, I just think it's interesting that science builds upon itself. You know, she recognized that this was something new because of previous work that she'd done, but it still took a while for things to catch up. And when um, they were doing this research, um, it was originally called, I'm going to look at my notes, it was originally called B814, um, and they were trying to figure out what it was. They knew that, um, you know, it was received from uh, David Terrell, a scientist at a different facility, and they were studying the common cold. They thought it was something different, but they just weren't sure what it was, and they could not identify it. Um, so this sent me down the rabbit hole of microscopes and how does an electron, micro, how does a scanning electron microscope work? So I'll put a link to this. Mm. It's like a one minute video that's just a little illustration. Um, cool. I'm a big fan for finding, you know, simple ways to explain things as an entry point. Um, and basically what it explained to me was that um, it basically works as a scanner. So picture like if your hand is here, they take an electron beam and they scan back and forth and back and forth forth and back and forth and then that's reflected back and those particles are eventually turned into an image and this is geo where it definitely connects with yours because the wavelengths are smaller than that of photons light particles they're able to get images of things in a much much smaller scale tinier so oh. teeny teeny oh. tiny the yeah. light bulb goes off. I've yeah. always wondered how electron microscopes work. Right. So I'm going to actually share my screen one last time. Um, this was actually, this is in National Geographic in another really good article about June. And I actually thought it had a really good description of an electron microscope. So the electron microscope blasts a specimen with a beam of electrons and then records the particles interactions with the surface. And so it explains the wavelengths. And then here's another issue. Um, part of the problem was figuring out how to actually isolate the virus. And prior to what June was doing, 
um, they thought that you had to really isolate a virus and get a very, very pure sample of it. And that trying to actually identify a virus that was in sort of a larger medium and like suss it out was almost impossible. This is what June pioneered. She realized that she could use antibodies taken from previously infected individual and basically use that to get to the virus and essentially shine a spotlight on it because the antibodies are drawn to their antigen counterparts. So oh. if she would introduce antibodies, they would basically congregate around the virus and be like, yes, here's the virus. And right. so by comparing it to other research and other things they had looked at, suddenly it was like, oh, there it is. Thank you, antibodies. Um, That's so, smart. Yeah. So she's, so... Mm -hmm. so she's done a bunch of amazing pioneering work. I mean, eventually she did move on. She, you know, got different degrees and things like that. But I think it's so interesting that so much of her early work uh, that really made a difference later on was done without a formal science degree, but purely by diving in, gaining those skills and having an incredibly sort of creative, pioneering, innovative mind. Um, she ultimately, I want to say she also ID'd uh, the first rubella virus. Um, wow. So that happened. Yeah. And then even when she'd gone, that's one of several, several things. She um, also mastered, a tech, mastered the technique of negative staining, where a heavy metal is used to heighten the contrast in the images, which also helped with things. So that's something that continues to get used. A lot of her images, original images, still appear in textbooks on wow. this. So, you know, we're going back to like the 1960s. So, I mean, I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and even when she went into retirement, um, she came back out and was able to produce some of the first uh, high quality photographs of the HIV, of HIV made with an electron microscope in the 1980s. So she passed away in 2007. Uh, I hope that's right. Yeah, in 2007. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, I, I hate that what we're going through uh, is what brought her to light because now you're finding a lot of her work is being cited in articles about coronavirus and, you know, trying to figure out what's going on with SARS-CoV-2. Um, but I'm really glad her story is being told. Yeah. June. So that's June. I really like June. Yeah. I need to incorporate her into something. I that's think so very, too. Very, very cool story. Yeah, yeah, and it fits in with our with our whole glossed over initiative to bring yep. to light stories of folks who have done amazing work but have essentially been glossed over by history and by history. Front. Yeah, you know they're still using those heavy metals to do imaging in healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. For example, when I had my MRI arthrogram on my hip before I had the surgery, they literally do inject you with a heavy metal and that's what's used to do the contrast so that they can see the imaging deep inside of your hip because, um, you know, it's, it's just hard. There's a lot of stuff in the way of that bone, including your other pelvis sitting on top of it. So it's very hard to see the materials on the inside. And um, it's a little unnerving to think you know, oh, I'm going to just inject myself with some heavy metal just temporarily. I think it's <laughs> gladolinium. Gla I'm going to get it wrong. Uh, I'll look that mm -hmm. one up. I should. Yeah. But it's interesting how that does make they, the, what I understand about the surgery itself is that until they really had that MRI, they weren't able to diagnose my uh, genetic disorder because they couldn't literally couldn't see the bone deformity in any of the imaging that they had but that contrast that's created by those heavy metals mm -hmm. in the MRI machine then they're able to see with great definition all the issues so it's pretty cool stuff is there anything that your doctors tell you afterwards to help your body like your liver process those heavy chemicals out oh that's that would be a kind of medicine that I don't think is a piece of vocabulary in orthopedics uh no they didn't say anything <laughs> about that no. I'm sorry. That, no, that's all right. You know, and it's funny because you read about it and they're like, well, if you're pregnant, it'll leave your body within 24 hours. And I was like, well, first of all, uh, I'm not injecting myself with anything if I'm pregnant to start with. But the idea like, ah, it's just 24 hours. That's always a little disheartening. You're like, are you sure about right? that one? Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will make a plug. If you want to know more about the liver, go back to episode one because we took a deep dive into the liver in episode one. And it's a New York Times piece as well. That's right. What do you oh, have today, exactly. Ms. Taryn? Let me see. Uh, transitioning from color into gray matter. Ooh, nice. Can, can we make that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> let, me, let me share my screen. Okay, so I have gone to my 
back to my alma mater. So I found this on, uh, on Twitter, actually, because um, Duke is coming up in my feed a lot for some reason. Hmm. And it's really fascinating. So we're going to kind of we'd jump into this and then jump back to, to previous research of this, of this researcher. But uh, this neurobiologist has um, found a cluster of neurons in a part of our brain that can ultimately shut off pain. And there's a really interesting and innovative way that, that this takes place. Now, the researcher, I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman. The name is uh, Fan Wang, um, and it's Wang as well as their um, research assistant that have done this study. Um, so they have found a single off switch that dampens the response of dozens of pain promotion centers. So one of the issues of pain, we've talked about pain a lot before, um, is that pain um, manifests in so many different areas of our brain. Um, and so apparently there's a up to upwards of 16 areas in our brain that sort of um, process pain, whether it's connected emotionally or you know, through PTSD or actually physical triggers. But they were able to isolate in mice this area in the amygdala, this tiny little, and so let me go back to this, the areas that of the red magenta and yellow cells, so we've gone back to yellow, these are part of a collection of neurons called the C aga. It's, I have no idea that's how we pronounce it, but it's C-E and then A-G-A. And C-E um, means central and, uh, and then the amygdala. And so that's where these, these cluster of neurons are. And when these neurons, uh, this little cluster of neuron uh, is activated, and the way they activate it in the mice is optogenically, so that means with light. Um, it turns off those 16 places in the brain that processes pain. So it's not actually dampening anything, it's, act it's activating this little area that then turns off the pain. Now, the interesting part about this is how the, these researchers came to it is their earlier studies were on um, anesthesia. Anesthesia. Is that how I say it? Yes. Anesthesia. Anesthesia. <laughs> anesthesia. I've always had a problem saying this. Anesthesia. 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 So they did a 2019, and here we are on their 2019 um, research paper, the same researchers, because they were trying to figure out how anesthesia works in the brain to put you to sleep and to turn off your pain. And so, you know, we keep, uh, I think we've talked about this before, of it, you know, I think that there was sort of a general consensus because it's been a mystery since anesthesia was first used in the late 1800s of how it actually worked. Nobody was quite certain. We, we thought that there was, it was interrupting sort of connective paths between the different lobes of the brain. But what they found was that there was a cluster in this research study all of a year ago, that there's a cluster of neurons in the hypothalamus that actually triggers this deep sleep state. So in um, running this experiment on mice, when they would activate this small cluster of neurons, and they were called, what are they called again? I have it somewhere. The sopra, sopraotic nucleus in the hypothalamus. It actually simulates a deep sleep state. It releases these large amounts of hormones like uh, vasopressin. Huh. And mm. so you would have, and so of course this again would be um, very uh, invasive uh, wires that would be in um, a mice and a mouse, and it would be optogenically activating this little section of neurons, and they would activate that section of neurons, and the mice would literally fall asleep. Um, considering that for the last three nights, my lovely, wonderful child has woken me up at two in the morning for not being oh. able to sleep, could we Ooh. figure out a way to inject something into her supraoptic nucleus? <laughs> well, they absolutely are trying to um, find what, what they do for that. And here, let me stop the share for a second. Um, uh, so what they're doing in for this uh, to, to sort of springboard off this research is they're doing genetic analysis of this tiny little area of in the amygdala, which is weird in and of itself that it's in the amygdala because the amygdala is usually associated yeah. with like emotions and, and almost negative emotions and is very primal. primal and so yeah. to think that there's just this tiny part of the limbic system, it's a tiny little area that then connects to 16 different areas in the brain to shut off pain receptors is but actually 
Hearing you say that, and I am not a neuroscientist, but hearing you actually say that out loud, it almost seems to make sense to me because when you're in fight or flight mode, you, you know, you hear stories about like people Lifting carrying someone three yeah. times their weight, like running through a forest out of danger, being chased by a bear. Um, so normally that would be very painful, but you hear people suddenly, you know, having sort of superhuman strength in a way that makes sense to me. And they thought to, to take that point of view because of how placebos work. And so let me just oh, share a little bit more. This is a Harvard Health, uh, Harvard Medical School um, piece on the power of the placebo effect. But the researchers in, in the previous Duke study had said that because they knew that placebos do actually work, that it had to be um, specific to one area of the brain as opposed to a consortium of different areas, because otherwise, you know, a single placebo pill they theorized didn't work. And so I just went into, looked, and we'll just post this, I won't get into the power of the placebo effect, but, you know, it has been medically proven now that it does have, um, you know, an effect uh, as a treatment. And, you know, it doesn't reduce your cancer, but it can help your, you process pain. It can help you reduce stress and sleep better. And, uh, and there's something about the, the procedure of it where you have to be taking a pill and it be like a systematic framework that your body responds to that, not just like the power of positive thinking, but the actual process of taking a placebo pill. Yeah. Which I well, and interesting. We learned at that one Sloan event, uh, we all three were there at the, the film screening. Yeah. But the the drug the drug story yes yeah so yes. the person overdosed because they were in the 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 different local environment that they were used to shooting up in that stuck with me i think it's fascinating absolutely that your brain is primed by your surroundings which makes yeah. total sense yeah so they're doing based they're they're analyzing the genes of all these um of this small cluster of neurons and they're basically trying to find um, drugs that will activate those cells by transcripting the surface receptors. So if mm. they can find a drug that can just activate a surface receptor of this little cluster, they can activate it in the way that optogenetically they do, but that's an invasive procedure. Wow. Wow. That is very cool. Cool, right? Yeah. It's interesting though, because it does harken back to an article we had talked about in a previous episode about being able to, um, get rid of painful memories. Mm -hmm. And obviously like right now we're talking about physical pain. Um, but I am curious about the question of how much physical pain do we need to be able to experience so that we know when we're in danger, in danger. and where's the sort of the line of, okay, this is pain that actually we, we don't need to experience this level. There's actually, strangely you say that, I had kept for some reason, and it's, I swear, dated five years ago, but the cover, it was a New York Times magazine insert, and the cover of it, of it was She Feels No Pain, and mm -hmm. it was a teenage girl that has a genetic anomaly oh, yeah. where she doesn't have pain receptors, mm -hmm. yeah. and so it's a danger to her because she doesn't know if she's burning herself or breaking her leg, or she just has no pain, and it's just, it's a really, and I kept it for some reason, it's a really interesting deep dive those, into that. Those people have shorter lifespans because they don't have those... Uh, mm -hmm. receptors that way. So they end yeah. up getting hurt and, and damaged and they'll have things like, um, oh, like you would get with diabetes. You'll have, you know, limbs having circulation issues, but you're unaware of it, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So what is, okay. uh, let's do our lightning round. What is everybody either watching, reading, listening to this week that uh, is good to pass on? Uh, I'm watching The Great. Um, it's on Hulu. It's uh, a sort of semi-fictionalized story about the early years of Catherine the Great when she first marries Peter, the not so great, um, and her plans for <laughs> the coup. Um, but it's, uh, I love it because it's irreverent and fun. Um, it, I, the, whoever did the favorite, um, that director, he's involved in it somehow. And it has that sort of that sort of energy to it mm -hmm. and it's very modern and current sort of in its dialogue um and uh, Catherine the Great is, is portrayed as such a you know she's this very naive 
um, idealist, but she's incredibly educated and she sort of pours that naivete into this um, assertiveness to change Russia. And so you're following her plan to, you know, because the court of, of Peter is just debaucherous and ridiculous, you know, and, and she's like, the, you know, we need to get rid of him. And it's her pairing up with Orlov, who is another scholar and, and it's just delightful. And that pairing that with Mrs. America on Hulu too, it's like this ladies night and I'm like, girl power. <laughs> right. Okay. So my mind to share this week is actually Mrs. America. And I was going to say, I'm glad to hear that the great is good. Be, the great is indeed great because it keeps showing up ev in my feed every time I log on to Hulu to watch a new Mrs. America episode. Um, so clearly they're in sync. Um, and Mrs. America is also a sort of fictionalized based on real history account of the passage of the ERA. So it's about the second wave of feminism that took place in the 1970s. And the cast is amazing. Um, each episode sort of centers on one particular woman who was involved in the movement or the anti-movement. Um, and yet the other women still weave in and out of different episodes. And uh, chief among them is Kate Blanchett as Phyllis Schlafly. I now know how to pronounce wow, that. Wow, that was very good. Thank you. Um, they actually make a point of it. It's kind of an, uh, an ongoing thing in the series, which is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, and Phyllis Schlafly, uh, for those who may not be familiar with her, was uh, worked against the ERA. She's a very uh, intense conservative um, activist. Um, and it's just, it's so interesting because um, being a very progressive person myself, um, I really had only been, I didn't know her story at all. And I had definitely been, uh, had some bias against her. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but they do such an interesting job of storytelling and Kate Blanchett's performance is so nuanced and, and wonderful. It's um, so good. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I love the, one of the things I really love about the series is that it is not monolithic. It does not present, I am woman as one story. And it talks about, you know, all of the different groups who were working within the movement and how they did or did not join forces and where all the tensions were and different generations of feminists and how they define themselves and sometimes work together, works against each other. Um, so that's my, I, my recommendation. Yeah, I, I couldn't recommend it more. It's fascinating. Those, yeah. those intercon the, the interconnections between the different groups and within the mm -hmm. group of like, oh, I'm a feminist, but I won't be a lesbian feminist or, you know, within the black, um, within the black groups of like, they all have, they, you know, mm -hmm. they won't work with white feminists. And it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Love and it. Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, Chia. I have to watch Mrs. Yeah. America. Apparently, I am way out of the loop. Um, I was going to recommend this book called The Formula, and I'm not going to say his name right, but by Albert Laszlo Barabosa. I'm not sure I'm saying that. I'll get it right in the notes. We'll, we'll put it in the notes. Exactly. Um, Laszlo Barabosa. Well, exactly. He's Hungarian, and I'm sure I'm completely saying it wrong because there's all kinds of cool accents everywhere in that name, and I'm just like... But anyway, it's um, he's a physicist turned network scientist who uh, uses his analysis to basically understand why do some things become popular and why do others not and what are sort of the factors that we can uh, harness from understanding data science to propel our own um, futures forward. And he's specifically talking mm -hmm. about kids in academia. You know, when they say, how do I make my breakthrough? How do I forge my path forward um, as a scientist? Um, but I think it applies to pretty much anybody in any industry if you can sort of extrapolate and translate to your own world. Of course, there's a lot of science examples in there, Einstein being a primary one. But, you know, you get all of the, the characters that you get in Malcolm Gladwell's books. You get uh, Paul Dirac and you get uh, Marie Curie and you get in, uh, I don't know, Michael Jordan. I'm just making up names, but you know, like people that we all <laughs> hold up as the, the paragons of whatever their fields are. And so there's just story after story about that, which is pretty interesting. So, uh, good, good intellectual quick read, like 250, 250 pages. Easy breezy. Nice. Malcolm Gladwell's masterclass is actually pretty good. Ooh, mm. is it on writing? Yeah. Did you take it? Uh, I, yeah, I listened to it. Um, I didn't do any of like the, the, if there was any handouts to do, no, I just mm -hmm. podcasted it. Cause you can do that for masterclass too, is listen to the audio version. Oh. Just um, writing, but researching and interviewing and journalism and marketing. It's just, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it was really fascinating. There was some, some really great stuff mm -hmm. and little jewel, little nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. That's actually something I would like to listen to. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm down for that. We, we should all reconvene after we've listened and have a nice conversation. Oh, well, ladies, thank okay, you. Okay. This is fun as always. I know. That's good. Yes. All right. Well, spring. Get spring has sprung. Spring has sprung. <laughs> Although by the time this airs, we might be in the heat of summertime. Very That's true. true. I know. In the valley here, it already feels like it. Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll as we warm. like to say, we're on a string, our own little space time continuum on the sirens. So <laughs> it's all true. right. All right. See you next time. Stay cool. Bye. 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 Bye.